Praise the Lord. I am uh, thankful to be standing before you all once, one more time with the Word of God. And I praise God that His Spirit is moving uh, in our midst and uh, working in each of our hearts. And I thank God uh, uh, some of you have heard uh, there, there's this revival that's going on at Asbury uh, that has been going on over 80 hours straight. And I see that um, God is working mightily in the ha- hearts of people. And I thank God for His Spirit that is still active and powerful today. Uh, let us also turn to God in these last, very last of days uh, to seek Him and to seek His power and wisdom. Amen. So uh, for today's meditation, um, I am going to actually uh, transition to our next series. Um, when uh, uh, Justin spoke last, he uh, 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 went over a summary of our last series, which we went on for several months uh, uh, in 22 and early part of this year, was the topic of the new and living way. God was faithful. He taught us, the speakers, uh, and hopefully you all as well, new things from the Word. Uh, for now, we are going to switch to uh, studying a book of the Bible, and which is the book of James. And so we're going to spend the next few weeks um, or months, uh, however long God wants to take us through that, um, we're going to study the book of James. And um, I'm going to just kick it off and um, kind of give an overview and cover uh, some thoughts from the first part of that uh, book of James. And uh, uh, Joel uh, uh, Jacob uh, spoke last night at the Saturday prayer from the book of James. And uh, uh, he said one thing, that if Jesus is saying something once, um, uh, it is important. But if he's saying something twice or three times, you know that it's very important. So uh, so I'm going to take that as an encouragement because I'm going to uh, focus on the first few verses of James here eventually. But know that, you know, uh, repetition does not mean that uh, we are uh, just trying to repeat something, you know, uh, regurgitate something. But it really means that God is uh, speaking to us the same thing through multiple people. So we might as well have our ears open to hear. Amen? Amen. We have ears to hear? Amen. All right. So uh, just a little bit about James, uh, the writer and the context of James. Uh, there were three prominent Jameses in the Bible uh, that could have written this book. Uh, but most scholars and everybody agrees that this was written by uh, James, uh, the brother of Jesus or the half-brother of Jesus, who came, uh, who Mary had uh, several children. He had two uh, brothers that we have James and Jude, we know, that uh, wrote books of the Bible. Uh, interestingly, James, uh, the brother of Jesus, was not a believer, is what people believe, or all signs point to that, was not a believer in Christ uh, when, uh, when, uh, when Christ was alive. And uh, in fact, I mean, he was a faithful Jew, but he did not believe at the time that Christ was the Messiah. And, but it is believed that uh, when he saw, uh, he probably saw his brother die on the cross, and when he saw the resurrected Jesus, and him appearing to him, uh, the resurrected Jesus, that likely shook the core of his beliefs, and uh, caused him to believe in Jesus as the Savior and the Messiah of the world. Um, and in fact, there was such a profound change in him that even the, he was considered, he was the leader or the bishop of the church in Jerusalem. And we can see later, uh, we can see kind of from Acts and other parts of the Bible, uh, Bible that he was even a leader over some of the prominent apostles and responsible and had oversight over the church there. So, so, so some of you might think, I, you know, I don't, know much about the Bible, don't know much about anything. I'm, you know, spent all my life not caring much about it. If you look at the life of James, you can see that God doesn't care where you started, but he can take you where he wants to take you through his spirit. Amen? So just trust in him and give yourself to him. And you can see James 
uh, wrote a very important book of the Bible. In fact, it was one of the earliest epistles written uh, out, of the, out of the New Testament. And uh, it is believed to have written uh, uh, in AD 48, 49, around that time frame. And you can see in the text um, that if you read the book of James, and I encourage you to read the whole book of James, in, uh, maybe not in one sitting, if you can, but just continuously. And you can see several common themes. One thing that comes out uh, is of the book of James is the sincerity with which he believed Christ. So imagine he knew Christ, I and mean, he knew Jesus as his older brother, uh, but did not believe him as the Messiah. And then he had the revelation of Christ, and now he believed in him in such sincerity that it uh, flows out of the text uh, when you read the book of James. Some of us, you know, we grew up in church, we're just jaded, and kind of our minds are corrupted, we're kind of skeptical, been around this. Uh, sometimes we need, need a refreshing or a renewal to see Christ in a way we hadn't seen him before, not through the lens of other people, right? But like James himself witnessing the resurrection of Christ and see the power that is behind it and, ask, and asking God to, for that power to be poured out in ourselves as well. So just, uh, just if you go to the next slide, if you don't mind, uh, just some of the common themes that you'll see that we'll cover uh, throughout the book uh, that kind of a thread, sometimes he repeats things and comes back, uh, but generally, you know, he talks about trials and temptations and kind of the wisdom and patience you need to endure through those. Uh, and then he talks a lot about genuine faith and works. Uh, in fact, uh, it's complementary to Paul's writings, but sometimes some people kind of take uh, things to the extreme and think that James is speaking heresy, but it's actually not true. He's adding to Paul's writing to say, you cannot say you have faith if you don't show the faith through your works. Right? He says the devils also believe in Jesus and they tremble, right? but they don't do the works of Christ. So, so he talks about genuine faith and works will cover all that. Uh, he talks about, a lot about favoritism and hypocrisy where you, know, you favor one person over the other, a prominent, popular, rich person, and you ignore the poor and the lowly. Uh, he's basically saying you're a hypocrite. And you become judges of evil things. And so he talks about that. He talks a lot, almost a whole chapter about uh, controlling your tongue. And how what we speak uh, uh, really dictates the course of our life. And uh, really uh, talks about how uh, he gives examples of a big ship or horses are controlled by these little, you know, uh, like the, uh, uh, the reins that control the horses or the little rudder that control a giant ship, right? So he's saying, so the tongue uh, is a little organ, but it controls the course of our lives. So he talks about that, and he uh, talks finally in the last chapter, he talks about healing and, and the importance of elders and, and uh, in confessing our sins and trusting in God. He gives examples of Job and Elijah and all these things. Again, coming back to uh, faith and trusting in God, right? So... Uh, so that's kind of a general overview of the book of James um, that we hope to cover in the next few weeks. Uh, and I encourage you, like I said, to read along with us or read ahead uh, so that when you come to listen, uh, you have an understanding of what we're talking about. So, so you got some homework. Uh, go and read the book of James. All right? Okay, so we're going to have a test later. Um, so, okay, so moving on. So now I'm going to come back to uh, the first few verses of, uh, of the book of James. Um, I'm just going to read verses 1 uh, through... Uh, actually, if you can go to the next slide, please. I'm going to read verses 1 uh, through 8. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting that he did not refer to himself as a brother of Christ. Um, he only called himself a servant of God. Uh, okay, so James is servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. 
Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let, the, let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him, but let him ask in faith, Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Amen. So, so coming back to verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Just a quick word about the word temptations there. Some, uh, some translations use the word trials, uh, and uh, some translations like the King JV or uh, King James Version or others use the word temptations. So if you look at the Greek word, the word is actually periasmos or periazo. That is a word that is used for temptation. The same word is used when the devil came to test uh, Jesus, it is the same word that was used to tempt. And other places where it's talking about tempting, it is the same word. But then it talks about the trying of your faith. That is a word called dokimion, Greek lesson this morning. It's called trying or testing, like to see if something will work out. And later, you know, we can see in other passages, uh, 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 later on, even in James, you can see the word called telipsis, which is more about adversity or tribulation or hardship that comes upon a believer. Like uh, Peter says about the fiery trial that is to come upon uh, the believers, right? So that is the word telipsis. So the reason I'm differentiating this is so that we understand that the way our faith is tested is not always through hardship or adversity. Most of, often our faith is tested through temptations. And James later clarifies that no, uh, God never tempts you with evil. Okay, so no, let no man say God is tempting me to do some sin. No, he says that, and it's the same word he uses, periazos, says God does not periazos you with evil. Okay? So, but the ways that our faith is tempted, just like the devil came to Jesus, and he tempted him to choose, pick a way between two ways. Are you going to stick with God, or are you going to stick with what the devil is telling you to do, right, in that situation? So the point is, the way our faith is tried or put to the test comes in different ways. Sometimes it's in the middle of hardships. We have to make choices. The difficult decisions that are faced before us, we don't know what to do. There's two ways to go. We don't know what to do. That tests our faith in God. Whether God is still good. Why did this happen to me if God is still good? Why is this horrible thing happened to uh, uh, you know, uh, my loved one when if God is still good? But many times we're tempted by the devil or the world or whatever circumstance we're in to choose a path that is not the path of God. <clears throat> and that temptation also tests our faith. So James is here saying, count it joy when you fall into these diverse temptations, whether it's an adver adversity or temptations through to commit sin, count it joy because all of these things, when you keep trying your uh, faith, when you keep uh, sharpening your faith, when you keep making the right decisions with the help of God, it works patience and perseverance and long-suffering. Right? In Romans 5 it says what? Uh, 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 patience, work, uh, experience work is patience, right? So when you have experience through overcoming temptations, overcoming trials, count it joy because it produces 
the fruit of God in us. The nature of Christ within us. But if you look at, uh, so then, that, but that is not really my topic this morning. And maybe one of us will co- talk a little bit more about trials and temptations and all these things that come upon a believer. But I really want to focus on verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That gives to all men liberally. The reason I want to focus on that today is because the point of all this is having the wisdom in the middle of uncertain situations or in in the course of our life. Now, what does wisdom mean? Sometimes we look at wisdom. Well, so James saying, if you don't know what to do, ask God, right? And he'll tell you what to do liberally. So sometimes we uh, think... uh, you know, uh, we have different ways of thinking about wisdom, right? So, lot, most often we think of wisdom as, okay, we're in a, you know, in a very practical sense. We have to decide a career or we have to take a test, uh, like an actual exam or something, and we ask God for wisdom or the help to know what to do, right? How to succeed in those things. Sure, there's an element of that as being wisdom, uh, but... Uh, but when you really kind of look into, uh, because the Bible has a lot to say about wisdom, um, and when you really kind of look into it, uh, you see a different angle of what wisdom is. So I'm going to point you to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And then I'll take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, the same book, all the way down to two verse, the last verse of chapter 2. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen? So Paul is saying here in Corinthians, giving us another view into what wisdom is. A new revelation that we might not often think about. He's saying... Christ himself is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So Christ is the wisdom of God. So when we say we want wisdom, we want Christ to grow within us. Amen? The power of Christ within us. The knowledge and the wisdom and the nature of Christ within us, to grow in us, is what we're really asking for God to do when we ask for wisdom. Amen? Amen? Sure, we want how to uh, react in a situation in the world that we don't know what to do. Yes, sure, but that's just a small part of it. The main central, don't miss the central part of this, is when you ask for wisdom, you're asking for Christ's nature to grow within us. Amen? That's what you see if you read from all of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2. That's what Paul is really kind of unpacking and unraveling and ends with verse 16 that we also read. For who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Amen. But so sometimes when we as Christians, we want somebody to tell us what to do. We want God to just, you know, write it in the sky do this. I'm facing temptation. What should I do? He wants us to, he wants somebody to just, a prophet to come tell us. No, but God wants, as you mature in Christ, he wants our mind to be transformed into the mind of Christ. Amen? So it's not just this somebody holding your hand all the time, but transforming your mind to to transform into the nature of Christ so that we think and act and behave like Christ does. Amen? This is what God means when he says, ask if any of you lack wisdom, ask liberally, I will pour out Christ into you. Amen? I will pour out the nature of Christ. I will build in you. That's why we say, as Joel said, as we've been preaching, Abide in Christ. 
Amen. Drink from him the water of God, the sap and the nutrients, so that the nature of Christ may grow in us. As Joel was saying yesterday, that you plant a seed, but it takes years for a tree to become a giant tree and produce giant fruit. Like in Kerala, you see the jackfruit, like chaka. Like, have you seen such a big fruit? It takes a long time to get there, but it starts as a little seed. Have you seen chaka guru? It's tiny, right? It's tiny. But it takes years to get to a point where that seed becomes a giant tree producing giant fruit. Amen? God is saying the same thing. The wisdom of Christ growing in us is what he wants us to desire. That's what comes from abiding in Christ. Amen? So, so that, so, that, uh, so, so what, what that means for us is you know, we have to change and transform into people not always, you know, just looking to other people, to always needing, you know, kind of this support. Yes, we all need each other, right? We need leaders in our life and all of these things, but we have to reach a point where we're being transformed, where our mind is aligned with the mind of God. Amen? Okay, so I'm going to uh, come back to uh, come back to James. Um, actually, let's turn to. So, if you go to the next slide, I'm going to draw some connections with what I'm saying. Um, first, in Matthew chapter seven, uh, this we know this, and Joel actually laid the foundation groundwork for me yesterday. He also spoke from this. Uh, Matthew seven twenty four. Therefore, whosoever hears these things of mine and do, uh, does do it them. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. Then I'm going to take you to Proverbs chapter 9 verse 1. Wisdom has builded her house and she has hewn out her seven pillars. Wisdom has built her house and hewn out her seven pillars. So now coming back to James. We've titled the series, Doers of the Word. And so Christ himself is saying, if you are wise, you'll not just hear the word, but you'll be, what? Doers of the word. So this is what wisdom is. And he's saying that such a person is like a person that built their house upon a rock. And we know that rock is Christ. Amen? So, it's, 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 so if you now look at Proverbs, so Proverbs 8 and 9, it's really talking about wisdom, right? So Proverbs 8 talks about um, how wisdom had existed from the foundation of the world. Wisdom created uh, everything. Wisdom is in the heights and the depths of the world. That's talking about God. That's talking about Christ, right? Well, so in Proverbs 8, that it is the wisdom. So it's called, so wisdom is personified. When something, a word is the whole being of somebody themselves, you call that to be personified, right? So Christ, so wisdom is personified in Christ. And you can really see that in Proverbs 8. So finally, in uh, Proverbs 9, verse 1, he's saying, wisdom has built her house. And she has set up the seven pillars. Okay, so I'm trying to draw a connection here to what we're talking about in James. So James is all about sincere faith. Genuine faith, which means that you not only just believe, but you do what you believe, right? Doers of the word. Whether it's controlling your tongue, uh, not uh, being showing favoritism, or, or overcoming the world and trials and temptation. All these are parts of doing the word, right? So, so as Jesus said, a wise man who does what he hears from God is like a man who built his house upon a rock. So Proverbs says the same thing. This wise man has built what? His house uh, and set up seven pillars. So connecting the two, you can see this house that is built upon Christ. But the, what do pillars do? Support the house, right? 
So this house is built upon the word of God by obeying God. But over time, as, you know, as we talked about uh, from Romans chapter 5, I'm just going to read that real quick. Sorry, I wasn't planning on it, but I didn't memorize it. So, <clears throat> uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 3. And not only so, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience. What we read earlier in James, right? Um, experience and patience, experience and experience hope. And hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. So he's saying that when you're building the house, you're erect, erecting these giant pillars to hold up the house. It's a support system for the house. So when you're you know, hearing the word and doing them, you're laying these pillars that give shape and frame to the house. So that means when somebody sees you in this house, a uh, little clue here is us, right? Each one of us is a house of God, right? And so this foundation, or the, so the foundation is on Christ, the rock, and the house is held up, the, fra- the shape of the house, if you can go back to that picture, uh, is given shape, by the seven pillars of wisdom. Amen? That we just read about in Proverbs. So now James really gives a key to what these pillars are. If you read James chapter 3, verse 17, he gives you seven pillars. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. These are the pillars of wisdom that hold up the frame of our house, that give shape to our house that is in Christ, whose foundation is on Christ. So what is the point? It's the same thing we talked about when we talked about the fruit of the Spirit. Is that when we grow in wisdom in Christ, when through trials and tribulations and temptations, when we overcome, it builds patience in us. Right? It gives shape to the house, like we read in Romans, that we get experience from the patience. Right? When we work through, when we overcome, when we live in the way that God is telling us to live, it gives shape to this house that God is building. Amen? Whose architect is Christ. Amen? You all with me? So, this is the point of wisdom. Coming back to, is building the wis- a house that is on Christ, but supported by the pillars which are the nature of Christ. This is the attributes of God that we're talking about, which give shapes to us in our lives here. Amen? So, uh, just go to the next slide. I'm going to wrap up here in a minute. Um, I invite the worship team to uh, come forward. Just, just real quick, uh, I thought of this image, but it's hard to be doers of the word. So we're like this chariot uh, uh, driver here. And we're pulled in different ways by these horses which have to be tamed, right? And we have to control them using these reins. But, but it's pu- it could pull us in the way they want to go. Sometimes in different directions, right? So the chariots are, uh, so the horses could be anything that you can think about, right? Or the, all the, the, all the, all the forces that drive our life in this world, right? Uh, all the, uh, you know, envy and greed and, and pride and all these things that, that kind of drive us away from the path of God. But using the reins that God has given us and the power of God, we read what Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, having the knowledge and wisdom in our, in our minds on how to act, we control the reins. And the, with the power from the Spirit and the power from Christ, we have the power to bring, rein these horses in so we stay on the path that we're meant to go. Amen? This is wisdom. It's building the house and doing the Word of God. Amen? This is ho- what we hope to talk about today. Just two quick examples, and I'll conclude. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were their Babylonian names, right? They actually had Jewish names. So people might know you a certain way when you live out in this world. They might know you as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
but they showed their true colors because of the wisdom they had. Amen? They did not bow down to the idol. They overcame the temptation that came before them. They had the wisdom and the power to reign in these horses that might have been easy to say, you know what, I'll just get out of this real quick. No, they used the power that was within to reign in the horses to stay in the path of God. Amen? And finally, I'll talk about James, the writer of the book. He was known as James the Just. He was actually even known as a righteous man by, um, by the Jews of that time too. He was uh, you know, so well versed in the Old Testament scripture and he used to go and pray for the nation of Israel. People looked at him, uh, but the Pharisees and the scribes did not like the direction he was going because of his commitment and confession of Christ. And so many of the Jews were coming to Christ because of James the just. And so one day they asked him to go to the top of a tower and uh, uh, to preach. They hoped that he would convince them away from Christianity. But he preached Christ and the people in downstairs started crying, Hosanna to the son of David. And the Pharisees ran up the tower and pushed him down. And he fell down, he didn't die, but they stoned him. And then one person took a club and clubbed him, and he finally died. James adjusts. He stayed true to the words that he wrote. He was a doer of the word. He had the wisdom to choose the right path. He did not give in to the temptation to conform to the, the law of the land. He had the power from Christ to withstand intense trials. Amen. This is how we build our house by doing the word. Amen. As we go into the very end stages of the end times and we face different things happening in this world, we will be squeezed to choose a path. Every step of the way, we will be squeezed and pressured to decide who are you going to follow, Christ or the world. I pray that God gives us a mind of Christ to know what to do at that point, that to have the nature of Christ at that mo in those moments. So you'll have wisdom to choose the right path. May his name be glorified. Amen. Let's just all stand out to our feet this morning.